You're listening to Inside Israel Today with Gil Hoffman on the Land of Israel Network. Good morning from Jerusalem and welcome to Inside Israel Today here on the Land of Israel Network on thelandofisrael.com where we are 77 days away from our exciting election that we'll be having on the 9th of April. And it's important to introduce the world to the candidates that we're having in our election. You already know about the Knesset members and the ministers and you know Netanyahu all too well. It's important that you meet the somewhat less known candidates who are running for the first time. So I decided to start off by having the candidate who lives closest to uh, the studio of the Land of Israel Network. Tehila Friedman is the candidate of Yeshatid, who is just starting out in Yair Lapid's party. Uh, I met her long ago uh, when she initially worked for Natan Sharansky uh, in the Diaspora Affairs Ministry. Um, there were a lot of people there from around the world who were working in that ministry, but she was the one uh, native-born Israeli uh, who uh, I think uh, learned a lot in that job uh, about the diaspora. And, and that led to her becoming the representative of most of New Jersey in Israel for a long time, where I worked with her closely because I am the Israel correspondent for the New Jersey Jewish News, among the many, many hats uh, that I wear in order to help put Chomas on the table. And uh, so I am honored that she came all the way from Baca to Baca by car, uh, to uh, come here and be on Inside Israel today. Tila, thank you for being on our show. Hi, good morning. So why are you running for Knesset? Ah, that's a good question. Um, I'm a social activist for the last 12 years, I think. Uh, it started when we came back from Boston, where we lived for a while. My husband went there to school. And um, when I came back to Jerusalem, and you know, after after you are abroad for a while, you tend to see things that you didn't see before. And I saw my city uh, declining. I saw many friends leaving. I saw the massive uh, negative migration wave that we went through. And I become involved. Um, and we established a local party called uh, Jerusalemites. And we established a nonprofit called Atnoi Ushalmit. And I become involved in issues of... Uh, first, uh, religion in, in city, not state, um, things that has to do with Shabbat in the public sphere, how we keep, how can we create a public sphere that can include chilonim, non-observant and unobservant Jews together. Back then, I think we, I was almost blind to the fact that we also have Arabs in Jerusalem, but we were focusing on the Zionist uh, uh, community. And... Um, after a while, um, I got involved in an organization called Nemane Torah Vavoda. Uh, I was chairing it for many years. Uh, it represents a more liberal voice in the modern Orthodox community in Israel. And one thing led to the other. So it was like more than a decade of, of um, very deep social involvement. And I reached to a point when I realized that there is a... Um, glass ceiling glass ceiling to what um, even very active civil society can achieve and there are issues that can't be solved without politics um, so two years ago I wrote an article in Makorishon that's a newspaper of I would say it's a more right wing the T newspaper religious Zionist. yeah and I wrote about something I called the covenant of the moderate people, like how the moderate people from all the different tribes of Israel sh should create a covenant between them in order to, to promote civil issues. And um, I got a phone call from Yair Lapid. It was very funny. Hi, this is Yair Lapid. I read your article. Apparently, people are reading. <laughs> he, he reads Makori Shon, he's very yeah. proud of it. He doesn't read Haaretz, he's even more proud of that. Yeah, I don't know, but he reads Makori Shon, I can tell you. And he said, you know, I read your article, I loved it, but I want to tell you something. 
covenant of moderate people you do in politics. Otherwise, it's a youth movement for adults. Mm. And, well, I was a little insulted, I must say, but uh, after a year, when he asked me to join the party, I said yes, and here I am. But it seems to be a strange fit. You know, you, you're a religious Zionist person. Those of you uh, listening on the radio and not watching on video here uh, can't tell that you, you're wearing a hat. Um, Lapid, at least because of his father, the, the late justice minister who is very secularist, Yosef Tommy Lapid, has a reputation for being somewhat anti-religious. How do you fit in that party? Um, first, I think he's not his father. Um, you know what? I don't think, I know he's not his father. He's not anti at all. He is for, um, he, yes, he's for integrating the uh, ultra-Orthodox into Israel workforce, into the army. That's true. It doesn't make him anti-religious at all. And also, that's almost the only party, a side of the ultra-Orthodox, that takes the issues of religion and state seriously and make it one of its, you know, flags and want to deal with it. So for me, as a person that uh, Jewish character of the country um, and issues like uh, conversion, like the chief rabbinate, like a relationship with the Aspen jury, those issues are so important to me. I can't see any other parties that they fit in. It's almost, for me, it's a natural fit. So what's going to be your first bill when you get elected to the Knesset? God willing. Um, I think the most urgent thing to deal with is um, in Israel, we have 400,000 people that can't get married at all. You know, in no way, because our marriage and divorce is only according to the halacha and the Jewish law, of the, uh, as defined by the ultra orthodox rabbinate. Yes, and also we have four hundred thousand people that are not defined as halachically Jewish, and so they can't get married at all, and this is unacceptable in any democratic state. So you know, dealing with it and creating a way for those people who can't get married in the rabbinate to be able. To have marriage in Israel, that's for me, um, that's the first thing I would do. Are you a feminist? And if so, what does that mean? How, how would that contribute to what you would do as a Knesset member? Is that even a question? Of course I'm a feminist, the proud one. It's interesting that I was religious feminist before I was a feminist. means that the first time it occurred to me that I'm discriminated and was in shul in the age of 16, really seriously. Never before of that I thought of it. In a synagogue. Uh, yeah, in a synagogue. I thought shul is a legit uh, English word. We have a lot of Christians who listen ah, to this I show. I see, okay. So in synagogue, um, where I realized that I can be the prime minister, but I can't lead fila and the a prayer, prayer service. And it just, it doesn't make sense. Um, so it took me to a long journey. Today, uh, yeah, I'm feminist. And um, for example, um, I was, um, I just sent a letter together with the other members of, of the party to the Attorney General about, there is a um, city in Israel called Nebrak, and they didn't let female politicians to put their posters with a face on on billboards and and it's not like it's a you know small city somewhere you know in the south no it's alongside it's, major highways yeah it's on major highways and it's you know you can be it's a, dis a total discrimination against women and also um it's, it's a, the right to be elected you know, a very basic right in democratic states was a uh, uh, hurt. So we wrote the uh, attorney general. I think whatever I do, the feminist perspective is part of it. Yeah, every, yeah. obviously it's going to be a major issue that I'm going to deal with. And also it's connected to what I said before, because most of the issues of state and, and, and religion today uh, has to do with women.
conversion most of the people who are converting a woman really uh, yeah chief rabbinate um all the interpretation to the to the jewish law uh, tend to be discriminating women or not doing enough effort to to help women what does it mean to represent the diaspora in the knesset how do you take into account the needs of millions of jews around the world when you cast a, your votes I inside the parliament of uh, in jerusalem let's start with um bringing back the kotel um agreement okay that's a small thing it's not you know the most important but for having me, egalitarian prayer at the western wall itself with an entrance from the western wall plaza as opposed to the entrance that there is right now about 50 meters away that goes into a, an egalitarian prayer area that doesn't actually touch the western wall though it is near it so it's not because the issue itself is so important but it's because it became a symbol mm. it became a symbol to um you know, Israel signed agreement and then just decide not to honor it. Yeah, honor it. And 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 people mainly in America, mainly in the more uh, progressive streams, were insulted. And this is, you know, it become a symbol uh, to the shift between the two communities. And that's for me, that's a small thing to try to bridge it again. And we need more. Um, Nathan Sharansky, you, you mentioned him as a, my previous boss. For me, he's more than a boss, he's a teacher. He's one of my, you know, my uh, educators to life. He thought of maybe we should create a process of hearing, like twice a year before the Knesset starts its uh, Moshav, its, it's um, a session. session, to have like two days of hearing of the Asper jury representative wow. um, on on different issues that the diaspora jury need to have voice because I don't think that every issue, I mean, I can totally understand people who said, whenever it has to do with security or um, borders, questions like that, if you don't live here, you can't have influence on that. And I agree, I understand that, but, Whatever has to do with Judaism um, and with the, char the Jewish character of Israel, it doesn't make sense. I mean, this land is um, owned <laughs> by the Jewish people, not by the Israelis. Not the Israelis got a permission from the UN back in the, you know, uh, 48 to have a, a sovereign uh, a Jewish uh, state, but the Jewish people got it. So, yeah, we need to give people a voice and we need to listen and it's doable and, and you as an orthodox jew want to promote religious pluralism want to give funding to reform and conservative movements um from I, the state i think yes but i want to explain how um I think what needs to be done is today Israel is a monopoly. Um, the chief rabbinate of Israel is a monopoly in, in giving uh, religious services. It's both funded and, um, and, and ministered. No, it's, a bit, uh, Supp it's a supplier. The, the, the chief rabbinate is, is funding and supplying uh, religious services. What I think need to be done that the state would be funding religious services, but a, a citizens can choose what kind of religious services they want to have and to create competition within this field of religious services. Different kind of mikvah, different kind of rabbis, different kind of... Um, Co uh, uh, kosher uh, providers? Yeah, kosher providers for sure. So it's like it's like privatizing uh, uh, this field of religious services, but not in terms of funding. Why? Because Israel is funding culture, theaters. Israel is funding sport. 
I mean, our system. The is state here. has never built a conservative reform synagogue funded by the state. Should we? Yeah, why not? I can't see why not. I mean, today there are between eight to twelve percent of people who define themselves conservative or, or reform. This this went up dramatically in in the last few years. I'm not sure they are really they are really you know active members in communities, but I think it's more like identifying with. It's like saying I'm against the chief rabbi. That's what people mean to say. But at least, I mean, eight between eight to twelve. That's many people. I don't see why they can't get, you know, what they need. Why? I can't see how me as an orthodox will be harmed by someone else having his own shoe. Like, what's the problem with it? It doesn't. I'm not threatened. I mean. I think being orthodox and believing in my way, I think that once we open the market, I bet, I bet we will win. <laughs> but I don't want to use the state in order to win. I want to have, to have competition, and I, I really don't. I don't see the. I don't see the problem. I understand that in. I understand why in 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 the diaspora there is tension between the streams because there is a big dispute about how we keep Jewish continuity and what's the best way to have people marry inside okay and I understand why people there say you know your way is promoting assimilation and da, da, da. but in Israel when we don't have an issue of assimilation this is not this is not our problem. Um, we want people to be connected to their identity. And by making it narrow, and by making it a, a extreme, and we just push people you know, away from Jewish identity. I just don't see what we earn from this fight. Okay. So, and the, uh, another thing that you'll represent, uh, if you make it into the Knesset, is, is the city that we're sitting in. Uh, you had opportunities to run for the Jerusalem City Council, and you turned them down. Um, How do you represent Jerusalem? You know, uh, in this neighborhood in particular, we have in the previous outgoing Knesset, you had two Knesset members from this little neighborhood, uh, Rachel Azaria and Chilik Bar. Neither of them are going to be coming back to the Knesset. So you'll be it. Uh, um, I don't know how many Knesset members that there'll be at all who live in Jerusalem uh, near Barkat is running in Likud has no uh, guarantee that he's going to make it into the Knesset. Uh, there'll be ultra-Orthodox Knesset members who live in Jerusalem. But if you end up being the only non-ultra-Orthodox Knesset member from the capital itself, uh, what can you do to promote the city? A lot. Uh, for example, the government made decision to move government offices back to Jerusalem or in not, or new offices to Jerusalem and just don't, I mean, the decision was made. It doesn't mean that it was really, um, how do you say, um, implemented. implemented. So I think what Jerusalem need is less uh, decisions and more implementation of decisions that were taken before. Um, so that's one example. Another example, um, local tax on uh, buildings that are owned by religious entities but are not used for religious purposes. We have tons of those. Um, it's, it's, <laughs> it's complicated to explain. But anyhow, You're talking about like a wedding hall owned by a church. Exactly. So, so there is a new agreement but again, that, that, that only buildings that are used for religious purposes would be free from local taxes for Marnona, but others should pay. Again, it's not implemented. Costs the city a lot. Um, the issue of Shabbat, how you keep the status quo on Shabbat and don't make this city into an only ultra-Orthodox place. That's a major issue. Can and should be also dealt from the Knesset. I mean, I can give 
um, different perspectives of what Jerusalem can earn from having a Knesset members that care about it. And when I say care about the city, I mean everyone, you know, swearing the name of Jerusalem, but people talk about Jerusalem as they talk about its border and the conflict. And this is it. And Jerusalem is the home of 800,000 people who live here, just me and you, and need to have normal and, and, and good life in order to, to go on living here. We don't want to make this place into a ghost, you know, a ghost city for like a distant land for tourists. No. There are Americans and French that own buildings here, but only come on Sukkot and, and Passover. Yeah. Yeah. And, and. It's heartbreaking because those people who, who bought those apartments, they thought that, that they're helping the city. Uh -huh. Is that, you know, they're making economical investment here. But the outcome was 13,000 uh, 13, empty apartments. Wow. And, and that's a major um, burden of, of the city economy because those ghost apartments, you know, it reflects the... the the small businesses ability to to make a living and and you know it, it um the taxes everything so yeah so we, we need the city to be flourishing and 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 from the Knesset you can do quite a much i'm not so sure because what we've seen is a lot of Knesset members come in with idealism like you have and enthusiasm and a lot of energy and then they realize especially if they're in the opposition it's very likely that your uh, yeshatid party will be in the opposition uh you might disagree uh that their ability to accomplish things is quite limited the coalition decides on their own what they support and what they don't they have a ministerial committee on legislation headed by the minister of justice who decides what even comes to a vote at all uh, automatically bills supported by the opposition no matter how wonderful they are get opposed by the coalition and even if you are in the coalition I mean, even if your leader of your party Yair Lapid becomes the prime minister he can decide what to promote and what not to promote and he has no elected institutions inside the party he decides on his own for the most part you don't even know where you're going to be on the list because he, he's going to decide that and he probably hasn't even made that decision yet okay okay, 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 okay. okay. Yeah, i can stop yeah you can stop um i'll start from your last sentence is he making the decisions alone alone i i don't think it's true i mean i know it's not true um before i made the decision to join i spoke with i think most of the Knesset members um, of the party, and I asked them very directly in a closed uh, room, is that true? And they said, no. As I said, once a week, we sit together, we go over all the, you know, uh, uh, bills that are going to be um, voted this week, and we shout on each other, and we have disputes, and we shout doors, and, and at the end of the day, we make a decision together, and then we all, you know, we all back it. Um, I wouldn't come if I didn't think my voice would have impact. So that's one answer. The other answer, you have this sentence in English, dream big, act. I don't remember, but like you should, <laughs> you should have your vision with understanding that, yeah, it's going to be baby steps to, you know, to move forward um, for sure. But I think what I understood is that in the nonprofit world, you can be very pure and you can do exactly what you believe in, but your impact is limited. While in politics, it's the total opposite of being pure. I'm not sure how you say it in English. Uh, and you Dirty, need... corrupt. No, corrupt. You, you don't have to be corrupt, but yeah. And, and compromising. It takes a lot of compromising. But the impact of what you achieved is amazing. So, yes, it's, uh, f I know, I I'm not a kid. I know that 80% of my time going to be waste of things that I 
either you know don't believe in or bored from but the 20 percent the impact of it you know would be much higher than... i'm glad you're coming in with those reasonable expectations a lot of knesset members don't and, don't <laughs> okay and they end up lowering expectations is, is good advice in life in general if you want to be happy <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm not coming to be happy i'm coming to try you know to do what i believe in and committed to and look maybe we'll sit here in another four years and i'll tell you you know gail it was a mistake maybe i hope not i believe not well we've already predicted on this show that the next election is going to be in another year so <laughs> <laughs> So you see, and 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 about sitting in the coalition or opposition, the situation now in Israel is so not clear. I mean, every other day there is a new party, <laughs> and it's really not clear. I I do know that the Ashatid, I think it's the only party today who can give a serious fight to the Likud, in terms of its its uh, you know volunteers, its uh, readiness to the election and to to the to take the you know to take the um to take the coalition to take the leadership the leadership yeah to take the leadership and um and we're working hard on it um so i so everything around us like uh, parties have been splitted all the time and we're fortunate enough to be to have people joining us um so i'm optimistic on that note ladies and gentlemen you just heard uh the optimism and uh, untainted uh, idealism <laughs> of a, a politician just getting her start and it's a really really beautiful thing that i've gotten to experience covering politics over the last 20 years here you know uh, her future boss, Yair Lapid, I, I got to meet him before he was a politician when he was just thinking about entering politics, got to see that vision, that idealism. He still has it. He still has it. He still has it. And also what's cute about him is that he also think um, there is fun, fun side it. I mean, to, to campaign, to meeting people, to, to be able to give people hope. And I agree. I agree. I mean, we are running now around the country and, and people are cynical and listening to us, I think they get hope and I think that's a lot. That's so nice. So ladies and gentlemen, I will be introducing you to many such candidates between now and April 9th. Uh, right now, I was kind of limited in, uh, in uh, what parties I can bring here on this show because some parties are in shambles and some parties are still being built. And some parties have primaries, so they need to be going on shows that have a few more listeners that actually are eligible to cast ballots over here. So uh, I'm very glad. And we're also some parties don't have people who speak English as well, as Tehila does and understands the issues that matter to the listeners of this show. So thank you so much for coming here on Inside Israel today on the Land of Israel Network on thelandofisrael.com. Thank you. And we'll be here with another show next week from Jerusalem. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Join Eve Harrow for a special To Be Shvat broadcast for Judaism's Birthday of the Trees as she interviews Rabbi Yonatan Nerol. Can religious leadership and Torah study be catalysts to create a better environment? For humanity to despoil God's earth is an affront to God, and us as, as religious adherents have an obligation to protect God's creation. That's a beautiful thing. I know that in Israel, organic farming was actually born in a religious kibbutz, in Kibbutz De Eliyahu. That's Rejuvenation with Eve Harrow, every Sunday on the Land of Israel Network at the Land of